San Antonio, the second largest city in Texas, in the southern United States. It's here that we find Bexar County Jail. With 4,500 inmates, it is more densely populated than the fleury Merogis prison in France, the largest prison in Europe. In the lead up to their trials, inmates spend several months here. Most of them are adults, but one unit is reserved for juveniles. All of them are younger than 18. Sergeant Stephanie Flores handles special operations for the sheriff. Before laying down the law in this jail, she worked in nightclubs. So, Johnny. hey, sir, you? How are you doing? Uh, you want to talk to me? Go ahead and talk to me. Uh, he assaulted you. He assaulted you, or did the floor assault you? He assaulted me. See you on camera. Okay. okay. Yeah, you... Stephanie deals with this type of violence on a daily basis. Anything is possible, but whether it is, do I do? Will I always believe my officers over the inmates? Absolutely. Legally, all of these inmates are innocent, but the conditions of their incarceration are very distressing. They love each other. However, love is not the reason these women are holding on to one another. It's cold? Yes. yes. And that's why you are... Yes, we're trying to stay warm. They know that. Can we consider them still innocent? Yes, we can, but we do not treat them in such. In order for, they have come into this facility and we are not to make it a place in which they'd like to come back. It is not supposed to feel like it's a good and comfortable environment. It's supposed to feel like jail. When you're asking me to, to tell you whether you're innocent or not, the only thing I can do is point to this patch and ask them, what does this say? It says sheriff, it does not say judge, it does not say jury. It just tells me that I, this is my job. This is what I do. For Stephanie, there is no room for empathy here, not even for the mentally ill. You want me to open the door? Why? I'm sorry? Does my reality exist? Yes, absolutely, sir. Okay, any, I can't open the door. What? Yeah, we're good. I gotta go. Once again, ladies, there's no talking. If y'all do want to talk... And this to is just the beginning. After putting on the inmates' uniforms, their hands and feet are cuffed. Once you're in here, you are technically being treated as an inmate. Females, step behind here. All right, well, Stephanie immediately introduces them to the harsh conditions in the prison cells. So I want y'all to see, you see all them in there. Just by looking at this in here, guys, I mean, tell me, that's awful, right? You see him laying on the floor. That's what they do, they lay on the floor. <laughs> Peeing on herself, it's just disgusting. If you don't like it, well, then don't come to jail. That's my policy. To make a lasting impression on these teenagers, Stephanie takes them here. 
to the unit reserved for juveniles. The inmates are the same age as them. This recreation does not take place outside, but rather here in the unit's common room. And there's rules. That toilet may be for pee only, that toilet may be for pooping, that toilet may be for both. And if you break one of them rules, you're going to get thumped for it. Be honest, they beat people up for going to the wrong bathroom. No sun, no clocks. It's like Vegas, but not as fun. To keep tensions high, Stephanie has staged an emergency intervention for the students with the jail special unit. This elite unit is trained to intervene during the most critical situations in the jail. Turn around and face these third officers. Corporal. With 16 years of experience, Lieutenant Spangler is in charge of the unit. These are my guys. If you want to fight somebody, they have no problem using force on you. Tasing you, pepper spraying you, pepper balling you. The chair. The chair. One way or another, you're going to do what we want. You ever seen uh, someone hogtied before? We do that. We do that. For we two hours, you'd be locked up like that in a hogtie position. If my lieutenant tells me I'm allowed to hogtie someone, it's like Christmas. Please. After spending more than two hours in the inmates' world, the experience has taken its toll on the students. It's a lot more intense than I expected. It's, it's way different than what you see like on the TV or the cameras. You know, it's just hearing it, smelling it. It's all different. This definitely makes me want to stay on the right track and just, I don't ever want to be in here. The United States has the largest prison population in the world, with 2.3 million Americans behind bars. And children are included in this total. They can be imprisoned from the age of 10. You know, you cannot put a kid in jail. That's not right. Only 30% of minors are imprisoned for violent acts. Most are detained for smaller offenses, such as drug use. Any kind of substance, it's a usable amount. That's all you need to prosecute. When they commit a serious crime, their age is no excuse. Children can be tried as adults and incarcerated alongside them. I don't want another 15-year-old to come into an adult correctional facility to deal with the nightmare that is dealing with the prison system. The prison conditions for young people are violent and end up causing them irreversible trauma. If these people had no mental health issues before they entered solitary, they do now. They are placed in solitary confinement, isolated for months in cells without windows, where they are frequently starved and beaten. When they are released, many of them are unable to readapt to normal life. like my childhood, my spirit died of me, you know. Some prisons use an alternative approach. We have to start treating kids like kids and not like inmates. But this is still a very rare approach. America has chosen to punish its youth the hard way, occasionally pushing fundamental rights to the limit. Here, there is no mercy for kids who do not respect the law. La Jolla, one of the poorer cities in Texas, situated at the Mexican border. This state 
holds the record number of prisoners in the country, 218,000, which is three times the number in France. The reason so many children are included in this total is due to the amount of police officers present in schools. The 43 scholastic establishments within this education agency have chosen to invest in a police force that is exclusively dedicated to them. They have substantial resources at their disposal, assault rifles, and approximately 60 cameras in each school, from middle school to high school. Captain Perez is in charge of surveying the students' every move. If I want to see what's going on at some of the other schools, I do have access. So all he has to do is just click and he can see what's going on. Uh, it can be uh, bullying, it can be narcotics, it can be uh, weapons, and in some cases it can be um, assaults. To ensure that all offenses are recorded, a system of paid informants has been put into place. We do have we got different type of criminal mischiefs, Thefts, have you reported any thefts? Okay. Information about a theft is worth $40, while information about a firearm is worth $200. With the help of this system, police officers make approximately 100 arrests per year, often for things which would not go beyond a disciplinary board in France. Okay, ma'am. Um, Maxel, come in. We're going to process him here. We're going to go through here. Toma asiento, miss. Y ahorita estamos con usted. Okay? Go ahead, stand by the wall. I'm gonna take you to picture. This 16 year old is here for punching another student during a fight over a girl. A complaint has been lodged, so this young man will be treated like a criminal. Okay. You have the right to remain silent and not make any statement at all. Any statement you make may be used as evidence against you in court. I know what I did is wrong. Although there will be no prison sentence for him, this fight will haunt him for the rest of his life. It's going to be on file for there. Okay. okay. With a criminal record, it will be difficult for him to get a school scholarship, a bank loan, or even a job. It is impossible for these kids to fall through the cracks. The police watch them all day. In this high school, there are six police officers and four security officers. They patrol the building together and collaborate with the school staff. Among them is Fabian. He has been working in this school for three years. Where are you going to here? Okay. Water Take a minute. This morning, he is escorting this student to the school supervisor's office because she has skipped class. What's going on? Well, why are you in my office? No, see? You have no idea why our officer brought you in. <laughs> so far, you've skipped two classes today. Can I trust you to show up? Yes? Yes? You can go back. As part of their day-to-day -day tasks, these police officers have a very similar job to a school monitor in France. They keep students moving in the corridors and make sure they go to class. Let's go, guys, hurry up. Guys, hurry up, guys, let's go. Let's go, guys, hurry up. We're here to help the students and the staff. We work together. Basically, at the end of the day, it's time for the kids, you know, help them graduate. That's what we're here for. Nowadays, more than 40% of America's public schools have at least one police officer at their disposal. Their presence is mainly required due to the war against drugs that has been waging in schools since the 90s. Regular raids are organized in the schools at La Jolla by the police K-9 Brigade. drug-free zone, mm -hmm. which are the schools, mm -hmm. and there is a zero tolerance okay. at the schools also. Any kind of substances, it's a usable amount, 
that's all you need to, to prosecute. The principal of this high school fully endorses this policy. The police officers escort her to the classrooms. We always welcome you. Okay. It's always good to be here. Good morning, everybody. Sorry to interrupt. She supervises the searches in the classrooms. I'd like you all to please step out of the classroom. Uh, take off your jackets, leave your backpacks. This is completely normal for the students. And that makes it more secure in school because of the drugs that they might take out. Taking precautions, it's, it's good to, to take care of our community, so it's not scary. He's already been in the school district for about four years. He knows what to do. He'll go in through the desks and work the, the classroom. They didn't find anything this time but drugs are the main reason for police interventions in the schools in this area. Three on Tenohoya. Three on Tenohoya, B-Go on Tenay from uh, 5108 and route to East Academy, uh, serve uh, a warrant. Officer Jose Elizondo has to arrest a 17-year-old student found in possession of a small amount of cocaine at school. Hello, Ms. Sanchez. Hi. Yeah. Okay, I have a warrant. Can we go ahead and start uh, picking up the student? He's here. Okay. Hello, sir. Hello. How you doing? Yeah. Um, let me just, yeah. Uh, Nelly, Nelly Torres. Okay. Um, we have a, remember the case from September? What's the case from September? Yeah, the baggie. The baggie. Yes. The baggie, okay. We had to send that out to get tested, okay? Um, based on the testing, the results came back positive. It, it is coke. We're gonna have to take it to a judge. So the judge can review your rights, read you the charge and everything. From there, we have to process you, take you to the county jail, okay? The teenager is terrified. This is the first time that he has had a run with the police. Just, just have a seat. Don't freak out. There's nothing that you should worry about. It's just a process. Okay. Um, Has my mom already? We, we, we're gonna call your mom right now. But it hasn't been done. No, but we're gonna call her. Can you call her? Can you call her right now? Yeah, the arrest is uh, regardless is gonna happen, whether your parents know or they don't know or they answer or they don't answer. At this point in time, you're considered an adult, uh, so we really, you're not a juvenile anymore. In Texas, it is possible to arrest and imprison children from the age of 10. Once they have reached the age of 17, they are automatically tried and sentenced as adults. For the principal of this high school, this is completely normal. I think that they know what they're doing at this age. They do know what they're doing. They need to be responsible and held responsible. They need to have some consequences because if we don't give them consequences, it's gonna continue. The young man is sent to the county jail for a few hours to have both his photograph and his fingerprints taken. Are you scary? Yeah. <laughs> never done this. Never been through the process. He will be released this evening and will avoid jail this time. But a reoffense will put him directly behind bars. The United States is the only country in the world that has not adopted the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which gives the right to plead the defense of being a minor. When the charges are serious, adolescents can be tried, sentenced, and incarcerated alongside adults. Brazoria, Texas, 500 kilometers north of La Jolla, this small town is known for its adult correctional facility, one of the oldest in the country. Austin Eversoll was imprisoned here 10 years ago when he was only 15. We have been given permission to talk to him for one hour under close supervision. 
Austin still has to spend 30 years in jail for murdering his father. And I, uh, I shot him because I thought seriously that my life was in danger. And he already had uh, told me earlier in the day that he wanted to kill me and he had a knife near him. So I just, I snapped and I wish I wouldn't have. Prior to committing the crime, Austin had already spent several years being beaten and humiliated by his father on a daily basis. Irrationally, I thought that by killing him, I would end the trouble and that I guess my life would be good. I don't know, this is the mind of an underdeveloped 15-year-old. However, it is at this age that his court-appointed lawyer makes him sign an agreement, sentencing him to 40 years in prison without a trial before a jury. This adult sentence sends him here to live among adult inmates. You're so young and you see these people and a lot of the time you're like, oh, I want what he's got or he's cool or he reminds me of my dad and that puts you and a trajectory to living a bad way because you're not around positive people. You're surrounded by criminals, people that are hardened, people that have been doing this, you know, time after time. Statistics show that juveniles imprisoned with adults are five times more at risk of being raped and their suicide rate is 10 times higher than the average prisoner. I don't want another 15 year old to come into an adult correctional facility. I don't want that to happen to anyone else for them to, for them and their family to deal with the nightmare that is dealing with the prison system. Austin will be released from prison when he is 55 years old. In Texas, this severity towards juveniles has yet to prove its worth. The rate of drug use continues to increase, and the reincarceration rate is at 42%. The zero tolerance policy, which has been in place for approximately 30 years, is increasingly called into question. Next, we head to the state of Utah in the east of the U.S. Here, juvenile justice has recently been the subject of a major reform. The reform's main objectives are to lower the prison population and to invest everything they can into rehabilitation. At the foot of the Wasatch Mountain Range lies the town of Ogden, population 90,000. Here, we can find the juvenile detention center known as Mill Creek. We have been given special authorization to spend a few days here. Behind these fences, there are approximately 60 teenagers aged between 12 and 20. They have been detained for serious crimes, such as murder, robbery, and drug trafficking. Today, they are playing a game of American football against a team from another prison. This type of encounter is only possible in this part of the country. And it is thanks to the juvenile justice reform designed by Susan Burke. It's a really different approach. We have to start treating kids like kids and not like inmates. If we talk about kids as inmates, then we're going to treat them like inmates. If we talk about kids as young people here and giving them an opportunity to change, and then our attitudes will change about how we treat them. This is an ambitious mission particularly since 90% of the inmates are members of gangs and sometimes rivals. And unlike in other prisons, these inmates are mixed, meaning there is constant tension. Because there was just a fight with Jim. I told him I knew it. Shara has been working in the prison environment for 15 years. 
she knows that the other inmates quickly have to be separated to avoid trouble. Hey guys, can you line up, please? In the gym, 15-year-old John has just punched another inmate. He is here as a result of 67 counts of assault, and the staff find it very difficult to control him. It takes six people to do so. Shara is accustomed to these kinds of situations, but this guard neither wears a uniform nor carries a weapon. She sees herself more as an educator. Handshake mine. Ricky? That wasn't you. Rick. Rick. No, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Shake my hand like that, Shara. This is a handshake. We go like this, though. We go like this, then like this, then like. <laughs> she looks after approximately 15 teenagers in this unit. What is the term that you're using? A resident. It's a secure facility for kids. Secure, I will not say prison. Among these kids is 17-year-old Jose. He is a member of a gang. He was sent here a week ago for kidnapping and violent robbery. They wanted me to do adult time. They wanted, and if I would have stayed an adult, I would have did 15 years to life. So I fought, I fought the charge, telling them to take me a juvenile. So we went to agreement. In this agreement, there is a condition which hangs heavy over Jose's head. If he gets into a fight with another inmate, he risks getting a life sentence in an adult correctional facility. That's good. But your mom's worried about that. I'm not sure you want me Here, altercations between rival gang members are common. Hey, you know me, Salt Lake City on the map. Fuck scraps. You know what? Stop. Stop. Shara intervenes to stop the situation from getting out of control for Jose. He just disrespected his gang, and so he walked away. So they don't fight. I know, I know. So that's my room. Jose has a few rituals that help to calm him down. This right here, this is just like weekly like goals. My goals are learn rules, find find someone to trust, and like staff wise, find someone to trust, and respect everybody. I always respect everybody, so I've been doing good. Orientation. Since he only just arrived, Jose is monitored 24-7 by this camera. Get your first hearing and see if I'm not suicidal or stuff. It's kind of weird, you know, because like it's right there, you know, and they're wa they could probably be watching you. And then In his fine. cell, everything so is secure. These aren't glass, these are metal, mm -hmm. but if it was glass, it would break, and so you're hurting yourself, mm -hmm. and they don't want you to hurt yourself. Yeah, they're that small. Um, so you can't make knives out of them. As in all prisons, violence is a constant factor. You about right here. All day, all right? Come to Utah, this is what you're gonna get. Most of the inmates joined gangs at a very young age. Jose joined the Sareños when he was 13. And he didn't really have a choice in the matter. All my family's in it. All your family? Yeah. My whole family. Sell drugs. Like, do missions, bus missions. Missions is like what I'm in here for. I agree. Kidnapping, robbery. Did you have to do that? Yes. You get jumped. Three minutes straight. Like me, I actually got jumped one time by a whole bunch of my gang members because I told them that I was gonna calm down. I didn't, like, I was gonna still bang. I got my ribs broke, my collarbone was broke, my jaw was wired shut, I had a couple of teeth knocked out. Um, I had brain bleed in my head, my kneecap busted with a baseball bat. You can't run away from it. You can't run away from it. I mean, when I get back out, it's gonna be the same thing. You have to do the same I'm gonna try to be smarter and not get caught up. You would have to go back into your game? Yeah. Kind of have to. You have to? You have to survive. And do you want to? Honestly, no. I'd rather be with my family. 
these teenagers find themselves in an inescapable situation. Kevin, are you going to get a green on? To help them get by, the administration team focuses on education. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like all American teenagers, these inmates go to class every day. The classes are held inside the detention center. For Jose's unit, the morning begins with a biology lesson. Today's topic is DNA. All organisms are made of cells. And their teacher, Mr. Thompson, has a few tricks to keep his students interested. So, your whole body is made of cells, okay? This is also why when they go to a crime scene and they want to collect DNA, all they have to do is look for cells that have fallen off the body of the culprit or the killer. Do me a favor. Now, it is time for some practical exercises with toothpicks and glass slides. In prison, these utensils can be turned into weapons. Where does this go? Trash. Okay, it goes in the trash. Throw them away. Don't try to steal them or take them, okay? Make sure it gets in the trash, all right? You know, so whenever we use equipment, whether it's glass or metal or even a toothpick, you want to make sure you get everything back, you know, in your possession so the kids don't take anything with them. The teacher is assisted by Shara, who has a very sharp eye. I'm just constantly watching them at all times. I actually check and they lift up their shirts here. a little bit to see if they and have anything here. hiding in their pants. And these are viruses. Um, I check right to make sure they don't have any pins on okay. them. So one, two, three, four, five. Right. I got six. I got all mine. Don't you start yeah. To encourage good behavior, a point system is used. This allows them to obtain certain benefits by getting more time to play outside or the chance to participate in some of Marty's classes, a therapist with a unique approach. Whatever's happening in your environment from a place of peace and hopefulness and a place of respect, good things are likely to happen. Aside from meditation, Marty's most popular classes for the inmates are gym sessions. A little deeper. I got you. They all want an impressive build, to look imposing and gain respect. This is especially true for Chris, the youngest among them. He just turned 14. He is often teased. Hey, he's a cutie. You think young? Yeah. It's like an innocent little kid. <laughs> for him, getting toned is practically a means of survival. Watch out my chest. You want to be strong? Yeah. Why? Strong, beat people up. This is not the therapist's goal. He wants to teach them self control. Most of them have histories of abuse and neglect in childhood, abuse, neglect, abandonment, which leads to kind of like problems in behavior. The practice is helping the kids learn that they can use their bodies as a way of kind of managing emotions and finding mental well being. Thanks, Marty. This new approach for keeping the young inmates disciplined seems promising. <laughs> the reoffending rate in Utah has started to decrease, but it remains to be seen whether this concept will spread to other states, since for the last few years, the United Nations has been denouncing the torture practices prevalent in American jails. This is particularly evident in New York, where juveniles are still forced into prolonged solitary confinement. 
the Big Apple with its internationally famous symbol, the Statue of Liberty. It is hard to imagine that the second largest and most severe prison in the United States is so close by, Rikers Island. Rikers Island has around 17,000 inmates, including juveniles awaiting their sentences. It is behind these walls that the life of After his release, his story captivates the media's attention. The country discovers the horrors of solitary confinement. What they do is they starve you, they, they won't feed you, and it's already hard in there because if you get the three trays that you get every day, you're still hungry because I guess that's part of the punishment. So if they starve you one tray, that, that, that could really make an impact on you. And How much were you starved? I, I, I was starved a lot. I can't even, I can't even count. Uh, this happens every day, and I feel like this got to stop because it's, I feel like this, there's a lot of people that's in there for stuff that they didn't do. The mayor of New York has promised to close Rikers Island within the next 10 years. Psychologically destroyed, Khalif Browder killed himself two years after his release from prison. In his memory, a road in New York is named after him. We were able to talk to a woman who worked at the heart of the system. In the unit where Rikers Island's 500 solitary confinement cells are located. Her name is Mary Booser. She worked there for eight months as a psychiatric assistant. And what she saw there traumatized her for life. If these people had no mental health issues before they entered solitary, they do now often covered in blood, from, from gouging their arms, from picking at veins on their body, blood smeared walls, people just banging their heads and banging, and I would see bare skulls, people with makeshift nooses, people just babbling, just gone, incoherent. Uh, some people smeared in feces. And it was very obviously disturbing to see human beings in this type of a state. The consequences of solitary confinement are disastrous for mental health. To put it bluntly, it scrambles the brain. People become very depressed. They start to have imaginary conversations with the walls, with bugs on the walls, um, anxiety, um, great difficulty interacting with people when they've been in there for a while removed from reality, um, plunging despair, people becoming suicidal. It is very extreme. Today, an increasing number of American states have restrictions on solitary confinement for juveniles, but a third of them still use it without limits. For the young people who survive this hell, returning to normal life is almost impossible. 
North of Central Park lies the district of Harlem. A large part of the population is black. This demographic is five times more at risk of being incarcerated than the white population. Reginald and his cousin were born here. This is Harlem. This, is a, this might be the best neighborhood in the five boroughs, you know? People like to dress. Not too much, too much of that gangster stuff. You know, we don't do that over here. We don't play that. He never thought he would see Harlem again. Accused of murder at the age of 16, he spent six years at Rikers, half of which were in solitary confinement while he waited for his sentence. Yeah, no man, yeah, I like this, I like this, I see you. After being proven innocent, he was released in February 2018, but he is struggling to readapt to life on the outside. Certain things out here can make me react to like I'm in a box, you know? I just can't get nervous, I can't be around a lot of people. Shaking people's hands and them touching me, I can't handle that. It's creepy to me, man. You know, the, the social life, man, because the box that put me in there, like, I've been so, so, you know, so used to being alone. <laughs> Reginald knows everyone in this neighborhood. Many of his friends have also spent time in the box, the nickname given to the isolation cell. <laughs> Shit, nigga, I'm 30. He's been in his adolescence before, too. Yeah, I've nope. been there since I was 18. He was there before me. Out of 10 years, I was in the box for four years. Two, growing up in the box. Gang bang. Mm -hmm. You gotta be mentally strong. Mm -hmm. you mentally strong, you might kill yourself. Yeah, my lawyer did, though. It's all it's rough 60 minutes. Which is why a lot of people bug out in the box. Mm -hmm. There's always, a, like, there's always a lot of hostility, a lot of aggression, because nobody wants to beat it. It's like a jail inside of the jail. You don't supposed to go super crazy, like local, yeah. you lose your mind, like you eating feces and stuff like that. It happens all the time. I don't want nobody to experience that. All those years spent in prison have scarred Reginald for life. He has suffered both emotionally and physically. which is evident from this scar on his face. It was the result of a fight with another inmate. Come here all the time. Did you ever play? No, nah, I, I used to play when I was young. Well, I don't play no more because like, I got pain in my legs and stuff from, from being stagnant, from not moving, so being in a, in a you know, not getting exercise. So I developed like a, a gap spacing in my leg. I had came out the box in the bing. I felt like something died of me. I felt like my childhood, my spirit died of me. You know? Happiness died of me. That's what I feel like. Today, Reginald is unemployed. As with his physical disabilities, it is very hard for him to find a job. While he searches for work, he lives here with his cousin in their family apartment. Like a third of the young people who have been in prison, he suffers from depression. The box of medicine on his shelf is always there to help him fall asleep. But what worries him the most is the anger inside him that he says never fades. Certain things that's not okay, it's okay, you know. To lash out, beat, to beat on a gate and for attention, to act like animals, it's, it's okay while you're in there. But when you get out, you're like, oh, yo, I was just doing this, this, like, I can't believe that was me. I didn't want to be this person, this aggressive person, this. You know, this, this sometimes hateful person, you know, sometimes I hate things for no reason, man, and I don't understand why. I still feel 16, you know? I don't feel like I'm a grown man, you know? So I was lost, I'm lost, I'm still lost. Like, I never grew. You didn't give me a chance to grow my mind. You know, you can't put no kid in there. You know, you cannot put a kid in jail. 
That's not right. He's a he's a cat. He's a he's a he's a he's a, he's a child. Um. Now he holds on to the hope of being awarded damages from the state of New York. Back to Utah, the state which has reformed its judiciary system in order to lower the number of incarcerated children. A new program has just been introduced in this brand new building, attached to the juvenile detention center. Kids in crisis are sent here to avoid jail. This form of preventative detention can be elected by parents, the police, or the social services. 13-year-old Mike arrives with his family. He immediately bursts into tears. He did not know about his placement here. Unsure of how to deal with his behavior, Mike's mother and grandmother have chosen to send him to this secure center. He's out of, getting out of control. He's starting to set fires. He's, uh, get, he's real aggressive. He's very angry. He tries to steal my cigarettes and he smokes in the house and he puts them out on his mattress and we don't want him to end up in prison and further when he gets to be an adult because that's the direction he's heading in. Mike will stay here for the maximum duration of 30 days. So our program, we have activities that if he wants to go to, that he, we, you know, we would go to Archway and ask him if he wanted to go. They're voluntary, so we wouldn't force him into, into doing them. Do the rights and responsibility like, um, of our program. Emotional um, regulation classes. Should I take them? <laughs> I just take them. Take them. Okay, I'll go to DBT. I here. Okay. I just want to make sure he was still because Mike has trouble breathing. He is very worried about being separated from his family. Although he is old enough to be detained here, he won't let go of his stuffed animals. Mike has to take a personality test to determine his follow-up care on site. Have you done anything you wish you hadn't when you were drunk or high? Yeah. Have you felt like killing yourself and I answered yes? Okay, what about mood swings? Um, definitely. Okay, and depression? Definitely. Okay, breathing problems? Um, does it count if when I get angry I go like... <gasps> no, because I think we okay. covered that in the All right. Okay, you have two stuffed animals. Mike struggles with addiction and psychological problems but he completely understands what is going on. It's mainly to help them understand whether or not I'm safe to be here or if I have to go to a more serious facility. Can you grab your bag? Yep. Let me open that. Oh, yep. He has already spent a few days in this facility, so he knows his way around. Sure. Uh, yeah, there's... Um, this is a wooden bed because they don't want kids on what's it called having metal beds because they can take the springs and injure themselves. And this is foam bed so kids can't use it to suffocate themselves, just like with the pillow. It's kind of like really s small, like a s cell. Mike's behavioral issues are linked, among other things, to his family situation. His father is an addict and is currently homeless. Do you know why you are angry? Because my dad's not in my life. Very sad. I'm not happy to be here, but I think it'll help. Are you afraid to go to a jail? Yeah. Honestly, I am because I feel like I might get beaten up. Also, you're not even allowed to have toothbrushes there because they can make shanks out of them, which is a knife. Mm. These adolescents are here for problems linked to drugs, abuse, or violence. Mike has befriended 15-year-old Samantha. She is here to get away from her mother, who hits her. How 
do you feel here? What? Safe. Yes. It's true, I just like... <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> I feel like I'm caged. Well, yeah, but it's a good kind. Yeah. This is not a good kind it... of cage. Oh? Good point. <laughs> Mike has difficulties with other kids his age. What? Sean, do you don't have friends outside? No, because I'm a bad kid. You no. really think so? Yeah, no kid, nobody wants to hang around somebody that smokes. Does drugs and stuff. <laughs> His struggle with addiction has little chance of improving due to the massive doses of medication he has to take. Every evening before bed, it's the same routine. Like in prison, Leslie checks to make sure he hasn't hidden the pills in his mouth. Take cough. Yeah. <laughs> cough that way. Okay. What kind of medication do you say? Sleeping, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, and anger. He takes six at night and then he takes four in the morning. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. In America, besides being detained, Troubled teenagers are often treated with very strong medication that has numerous side effects. Does it help? No. How do you know? Because I don't think it does. <laughs> Even so, he still asks for more types of medication. I have no melatonin here. There was no we can ask the nurse tomorrow. I can't sleep without melatonin. Melatonin is a medication which can help people to fall asleep. Thank you. So, Sean, I talked to mom, okay? And mom says you're gonna be fine without it tonight. That's fucking bullshit. Okay. I can't sleep without it. She said you'll be fine, She's but she'll be in tomorrow. I'm not gonna sleep without it. I can't sleep. Okay. We'll just check him more often than we would, because he's not happy, and he could hurt himself. For almost an hour, Mike refuses to settle down. He does not give in. He wants melatonin right away. I have no clue what I'm going through. You're right. I should be quiet. You're feeling stuck. Leslie decides to call his mother. Hey, these are not easy Mommy, steps. are you coming? Okay. Nice. Why the hell did you for, did not bring them when it's your responsibility and your duty as a mother and a caretaker to bring me my medicine? You should feel guilty because you're the one who put me in here. Feel guilty. Mike finally falls asleep without melatonin at around 11 p.m. He is still monitored by the specialists from this program, but from home. He hopes never to have to return here. Cut off from their families and disrupted in their schooling, incarcerated adolescents are exposed to violence and trauma that jeopardize their development and scar them for life. They return to society lost and stigmatized, often with no other prospect than that of falling back into crime. <laughs>